I've said in previous videos, something that's always a red flag to me is when the news doesn't tell you what has happened, they tell you what is going to happen in the future and then how you should feel about it. Because to me, that is like priming the public opinion. So that way, when this unusual event does occur, people don't start investigating and asking questions. You already have your built in excuse laid out for the public to follow. And I noticed that occurred here with the allegations of voter fraud. So they go out of their way to debunk before the election even occurs these allegations of potential voter fraud with mail-in ballots. They tell you that there's no way that you can rig an election. So if you hear any claims of voter fraud by Donald Trump or his supporters, don't believe it because we've already told you that that almost never happens. Even here on NPR in August before the election, tell you that there's no rampant voter fraud with mail-in voting. It's very low. And this is essentially the same thing as absentee ballot. But it's not just Trump supporters who are concerned about the potential for fraud with absentee ballots. That was the subject of a report done back in 2005. It was a bipartisan effort led by Jimmy Carter, and they warned that absentee ballots remain the largest source of potential voter fraud. And they had 87 different recommendations for how you can tighten up election security. I think it's interesting to notice that photo ID is one of their suggestions. So again, it's only racist now after the 2020 election when people would like to beef up this security if we are going to start doing mail-in voting in the future, which is essentially the same as absentee, which is this bipartisan committee says is open to fraud. So if you want the voter ID that this committee recommended, you weren't racist when they recommended it, but you are now in 2020. Interesting to keep that tidbit in mind as we move forward. But as we are going to hear in this next video clip, the reason that the mail-in fraud is historically low is because we haven't done this mass mail-in balloting on this massive scale ever before. So just because something hasn't happened in the past, since we're doing it differently in the future, there still is the potential for that fraud. So how can you debunk it if it hasn't happened yet? And that's very disingenuous for the media and the fact checkers to not point out that glaringly obvious fact that historically we've never had an election like this before. And it's not just mail-in or absentee balloting because historically with those, you have to request and have a reason for voting that way instead of in person. I know some states do mass mail-in balloting throughout the whole state, mail went out to everybody. Those states have obviously been doing that for a long time and have a system worked out. But for all these new states who are doing this for the first time because of COVID, not all of them are waiting for people to request the mail-in ballot. They are just sending them out to everyone on the voter rolls. And if you can't see how that opens up a huge opportunity for fraud, then that is just something that we will have to agree to disagree on because it seems very obvious avenue if you want to commit voter fraud. If you mail a ballot to everyone in the state, even if they didn't ask for it, does it provide an opportunity for fraud, especially when the state did not first purge or verify those addresses and they sent thousands of ballots to people that no longer live there? Just this last year in the ERIC system, they identified 91,000 people that are registered voters that are dead. 91,000 that that one system had recognized. That's a problem. And we should at least admit that's a problem. And for some reason, the other side was very focused on, we've got to fix the potential for problem from 2016. But in 2020, when there's potential for problem and things that have been shown, everyone seems to say, move along. Let's not discuss this. This system is, we only have confidence in it if it's completely transparent. And somebody who's challenging results has access to the information, the paper ballot backup, and have their forensic experts deal with the computer systems. And that, that wasn't afforded. I'm just asking, does that concern you? Again, that's the problem. That's why there's suspicions, because this was not, in so many cases that we've heard about, a transparent process. The first little block of videos I'd like to watch is about why it's necessary to continue these investigations. And the very first one is about a man in, or from a man in Pennsylvania who is explaining why the audits and the recounts that we have done thus far that the left loves to hold up is the reason this has been investigated. We've already looked into it. This is the most certified election in history. The point that this man is making is that if you feed fraudulent ballots into the machine and count them as part of the vote tally and then you recount that vote tally, you are going to continue to have the same results. The question surrounding the election integrity is not about the vote totals. It's about the legality of whether large portions of these ballots should have been included in the count and not because of voter suppression or trying to disenfranchise people based on their race. It is because they were filled out illegally and do not have the proper paper trail to verify that these massive amounts of mail-in ballots are genuine. So you can do as many recounts as you like People who want this investigated are not asking for a recount. They are asking for an audit of whether these votes are legitimate. And unfortunately, while I think it is important, I do think it is probably too late to ever accurately go back and say definitively what happened in 2020. What I saw as a forensics expert was an election process that was forensically destructive in the manner it was conducted, with the envelopes being separated from the ballots and gone to the other side of the room. 
The problem with that from being forensically destructive is that when you go to do a recount, okay, the machines did a pretty good job of recounting. So if I have 120,000 ballots, mail-in ballots at one side of the room and envelopes at the other side of the room, it's still going to come out 102,000 votes for President, uh, Vice President uh, Biden and 18,000 votes for President Trump. I don't care how many times you recount those votes, you know, the ballots are going to come out the same every time. This next clip is a montage of various people testifying to just different errors and laws that were not followed in their various states with their vote counts. We did find several areas where election laws and procedures were or may have been violated. These include missing or unmatched signatures on ballot envelope affidavits, missing serial numbers matching duplicate ballots to their originals, common usernames and passwords used to log into the election management system, insufficient security protocols and procedures, deleted files and churned logs from the data delivered to the Senate, and numerous voter registration anomalies. One of the most disturbing aspects of the audit was the county's lack of cooperation, especially their unwillingness to answer any questions once the audit began. We did find, for example, 26 mismarked boxes. We found eight boxes that uh, were not listed on the manifest, the chain of custody documents that Maricopa County was supposed to have since the election until they turned them over to us on April 22nd of 2021. We found uh, two boxes that were on the manifest but not present on the pallets, and then we found three boxes that were on different pallets and they were listed. So uh, the point is that out of 1,691 boxes, there were 40-some boxes of errors. What we saw there, what I saw there was a chain of custody in all cases it was broken. It was broken for the mail-in ballots, the Dropbox ballots, the election day USBD card flash drives. In all cases, the chain of custody and the procedures that were defined by the Delaware County Board of Elections, they didn't follow one. We found that there were incomplete and altered certificates. These are the certificates on the front of the envelopes that have to be exactly done correctly under our law. If not, those results may not be counted. How many of those? More than 3,000 of those identified by person were nonetheless counted, even though they are clearly invalid under the law. A second category, initials of clerks are placed on all of those envelopes. Why? Because the clerk identifies it having been properly received and identification is provided. That's the check in advance of the election. What did we find? More than 2,000 of those ballots in Dane and Milwaukee County had no initials at all, but nonetheless, they got counted. We also have special laws in Wisconsin with regard to voting in advance. We do not allow advance voting. We allow in-person and, and other voting as absentees. So anything before election day is under our absentee rules. What did the city of Madison do? They created a system where people could arrive at a park, hand in their ballots in envelopes five weeks before the election. Finally, there are other categories in which as much as 170,000 other ballots were submitted without any application. In fact, they considered the certification envelope the application, though a separate application is required by law. Three million people properly voted in the state of Wisconsin. More than 200,000 identified during this recount did not, but those votes got counted, and our statute says they should not have been. Joe Biden won our state by about 20,000 votes? Correct. And you're talking about over 200,000 that were outside of our, our law that probably, probably if the law would have been followed, probably should have been counted. If you were watching election night unfold, Trump was on track to win in these five states. He had, in some cases, double-digit leads. He had a massive lead in Pennsylvania. And for various reasons, all within about an hour of each other, these five states that Trump's winning in, they all say that they are going to stop counting the votes for the night. And if you follow normal election trends, how the votes tend to go up um, on a smooth curve, not these massive spikes for one candidate versus the other, you would expect that with those kinds of leads and with the amount left of the outstanding vote, Trump would have gone on to win those states. And it was only a few counties in each state, it wasn't even the whole entire state, just a couple of counties that weren't reporting their vote totals for that night. So I disagree with the notion that it would have to be every state on this mass scale. It seems if you've teamed up with a few counties in these key states, you just have them hold off on reporting their vote totals until the end. So that way, you know exactly how many votes you are down by. And just so happens, all of those states all found extra ballots at three o'clock in the morning that were all for Joe Biden and all of those states, Trump lost his double digit leads. On election night, President Trump was leading in your state by somewhere around 700 to 800,000 votes, depending on when you went to sleep. That's a huge number of votes. 65% of the voters have been cast. Michigan, we were ahead by 300,000 votes. Wisconsin, more. Georgia, we were down to 90% ahead. What are the odds they all switched? That seems incredibly unlikely. I mean, maybe in even one or two of the states that, that would happen, but in all five states and all of the counties that said, hey, we're not going to count anymore tonight, they all happen to flip. Now, there's a report from Politico that says that Philadelphia officials say that they will not be reporting any more mail ballots tonight. About 76,000 have been tallied so far out of 350,000 that have been received. There are at least six counties, by the way, I think it's seven total, that have said they will not count mail ballots tonight.
and all those counties were won easily by Donald Trump in 2016. Georgia obviously still in play. We may not have the results now from Fulton County as a result of the water main break for a couple of days, according to election officials there. Um, just with regard to, to Georgia, Fulton County is now going to stop counting at 10.30 p.m. and will resume their count at uh, tomorrow morning. So don't expect, you know. So that's Pennsylvania and Georgia, Georgia that we're not going to get any answer yeah. wrong tonight. No, no, stop counting at, at 10.30 at night. I'm not sure why. I mean, just because I guess everyone has to go home and they have to come back in the morning. Yes, they're normal people, Martha. They're <laughs> to us. Now you're saying Georgia is probably not tonight. Michigan is probably not tonight. Wisconsin's not tonight? I think there's a good chance that that's where we're sitting. And Pennsylvania's North not Carolina. tonight. Pennsylvania's strongly signaled, both before and, and, and during the counting, that you know they're not going to have enough of the vote counted so that we can you know, accurately classify what's going on. Yeah. It's possible that we're looking at five states. It's possible. I, I think that's right. They publicly announce that they're done counting for the night and that they'll resume in the morning. And they tell everybody and the poll workers that they can go home, no more counting tonight. But this news clip that's actually trying to fact check these claims and say nobody was told to go home, what they are admitting to is no, people weren't told to go home like they were being kicked out. They were told to go home because voting was done for the night, so there's no need for you to be here. And then at the end of the video, they sort of brush it under the rug, but they admit that voting did continue to occur after they told every, or vote counting continued to occur after they publicly said they were done and told everybody to go home. So you can be, you know, nitpick over the semantics of whether they were kicked out or told to go home under false pretenses. That doesn't really matter to me. The point is the same, is that they told the public that they weren't counting anymore for the night, poll workers went home, and they continued to count the votes. About there was one person working the polls who told everyone in the room to leave. Was anyone actually told to leave or just that they were done counting? Republican monitors claim they were forced out. They were made to leave, so it was done in contravention of the statute. Both 11 Alive journalists on site that night independently confirmed to me that they were not told to leave, but they were told counting was done for the night. Fulton County, they were telling us that their absentee ballot vote counting. Their workers went home from that this evening. They'll be back uh, around 8, 8.30 in the morning. And why are they only counting them whenever the place is cleared out with no witnesses? This part is true. The press and the party monitors were not given notice that counting would continue into the early morning hours, and they should have been. The Secretary of State says one of its monitors was present. The counting of those heavily Democratic absentee ballots did result in a big batch of numbers coming in from Fulton County in the 1 a.m. hour on election night. And so in spite of all of these news clips that I've shown you and the public reporting that is available for the fact that these states called off their voting for various reasons or their vote counting for various reasons, the experts at factcheck.org will so very helpfully tell us that Trump is being misleading when he says that the ballot count was called off. Even though anybody that stayed up late enough to watch on election night knows exactly what he's talking about. That around 1030 at night, five states all said, we're not counting anymore tonight, sent the, their poll workers home and then continued to count votes throughout the night and add in these massive dumps of votes for Joe Biden at three o'clock in the morning. This next clip is of various poll wor workers from Michigan testifying to this massive dump of ballots that were dropped off at their polling locations at three o'clock in the morning. I was a Republican poll challenger both on um, Tuesday and Wednesday. On Tuesday, things went pretty well and I was trained by the GOP party. On Tuesday, things went very well. When I was called back in um, early on Wednesday morning, I came back into the room. I could not believe, number one, how many more people were there, the tension in the room. And where did all these ballots come from? When I'd left on Tuesday, most of the tables had been complete. The table I was uh, overseeing at the time still had about 200 ballots left, um, but it certainly didn't look like there was going to even be enough for a night shift. I was very surprised to see the level of activity on the following morning. I was there at uh, approximately 3 to 3.30 a.m., and I saw the huge dump of ballots that were uh, delivered to the counting hall. I noticed that the uh, city of Detroit clerk's office uh, had there was their emblem on the white van that showed up with the ballots. Uh, I estimated that it was over uh, 50 boxes that I counted, and I estimate that up to 1,000 could have been fit in each box, uh, large boxes. Uh, there was no chain of custody. There was no accountability. There was no transparency. Nobody knew where these ballots had been. Uh, they say had to be turned in at 8 p.m. Uh, they showed up at approximately 3.30 a.m. So seven, seven and a half hours is a, lot, a long time for these ballots to be kind of in limbo, not with anyone uh, knowing where they are. Keep in mind that you could not videotape at TCF. It was strictly prohibited, potentially a criminal act. That's why all of these sworn affidavits, there's hundreds and hundreds of them, are so important because they are the key proof that severe impropriety took place in Detroit on election night. You said uh, between 3, 334, you said that there were ballots that, that came in late. Can you tell me what it is specifically that you saw that came in? Were you outside and you watched the truck and you watched them unload or were you inside and watched them bring in the ballots? What was your... Well, I was inside the TCF Center and okay. I watched them bring ballots in on carts. Um, boxes of ballots. So they were like open boxes where you could see the ballots in? Or yeah, you saw they, were, they were no different than the ones that were already there. And then what they did is they put them out and uh, so there was, there was a center raised stage and then they had tables off to the side and they would put the ballots off 
where they were already picking up the ballots, how they were doing normal business, right? I was under the impression that all of those should have been segregated and, and separated. Well, they weren't. They were put right up there. And then the person or the people that were running the, the, the election process basically encouraged the table supervisors in the, in the tables to come up and get work. That's how they were describing it. Come up and get work. Come up and get work. This next clip is testimony from an election auditor in Pennsylvania who is testifying that there were these spike anomalies in the vote count, which are these huge spikes all for one candidate. Usually you see votes go up on a smooth curve, but in Pennsylvania, we were having these huge spikes. They were all for Joe Biden, and in total, all of these spikes counted for about 600,000 votes. So what our team uh, has, has done is focus on the spike anomalies. And these are events where the numerical amount of votes are processed in a time period that's not feasible or mechanically possible under normal circumstances. There's a, a manufacturer specified rate of speed that a number of ballots can image, uh, be imaged and processed. Uh, those, uh, these spike anomalies in this chart really show where, where for us to look forensically to actually determine what happened with these votes. Can you explain at the very beginning what that line means, Biden injection? Uh, what that indicates is there is a spike in uh, loaded votes, uh, 337,000 plus or minus of some votes that were added in there in one big batch. So that was a, an anomaly in the reporting. Normally you would expect to see a smooth curve going up. So that big spike that uh, occurs there is a prime indicator of fraudulent voting. And when you look at this entire curve with all these spikes, can you calculate how, how, how much of a vote that accounted for for Biden and how much for Trump? Close to 600,000. I think our, our leaders are about 570,000. That uh, all those spikes are represented over time. For so Biden, correct. And how much for Trump? And I think it was lower than 200. So there's various fact checks about these claims of spikes in the voting. The fact checkers do not deny that they occur. They just tell you it's not proof of election fraud. And yeah, in and of itself, it's not proof of election fraud, but I would think it would be the circumstantial evidence or the probable cause, I think, or maybe the right legal terms to use there on how then you would get the warrant to do the investigation. And it's a suspicious circumstance that by itself is not a smoking gun, but it is clearly indicative of fraud. And it's insane that people think that there's no evidence and that there's nothing to look into. So if you were going to do an investigation into those spike anomalies, you might ask yourself, how could they feed that many votes into the tabulator all at once when, as that man just testified, it surpasses the capabilities of how many ballots could go through the machine at once? It's not possible to scan that many ballots in at one time. So how would they be able to make that spike occur? And this next clip is testimony from a different guy in Pennsylvania who is a poll worker who is testifying to the fact that this man came in You'll hear him say how many times the man came in. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it was quite a few. And the man would come in with a USB drive and put it into the voting machine. And there was no oversight or accountability to what this guy was doing. So this poll worker challenged it and demanded that they update the vote total after that man put his USB drive in. And what the new vote total showed was that that man had just uploaded 50,000 votes, all of them for Joe Biden. So I personally observed um, USB cards being uploaded to voting machines by the uh, the uh, voting machine warehouse supervisor on multiple occasions. I brought it to the attention of the deputy sheriff who was there stationed, who was a senior law enforcement officer, and I brought it to the attention of the clerk of elections, and I said, uh, this person is not being observed, he's not part of the process that I can see, and he's walking in with baggies, which we had pictures of and that were submitted to, in our affidavits, and he was sticking these USBs into the machines. So uh, I personally witnessed over that, that happened 24 times, over 24 times. They didn't update the vote live time. They only updated it about once every two or three hours. I demanded they updated the vote so I could see what the, the uh, result was. And it was uh, 50,000 votes. It doesn't matter who those 50,000 votes were. I'll tell you they were for Vice President Biden. But what was shocking to me as an American, that could even happen. Another thing that I hear a lot is that there's no way the election could have been rigged because these voting machines can't be hacked because they're not connected to the internet. Since they're not connected to the internet, there's no way for anyone to hack into them and change the vote totals. But as we will hear in this next montage of sworn testimony, that is actually not true. These voting machines do have the capability and in some cases are connected to the internet and we were lied to about that. And that was a key integral part of the argument for why these votes are so safe and secure and not susceptible to fraud. And you'll also hear at the end of this video, one of the men testifying to the fact that you can program these voter machines to register blank ballots for a certain candidate. 
So, or error ballots for certain candidates. So if a ballot goes through the machine, it comes up as an error, the machine knows to just go ahead and count that for Joe Biden. Or if you feed in thousands of blank ballots into the machine, you don't even have to take the time to bother to fill them out. You can feed the blank ballots through the machine. Those blank votes will all get tabulated as a vote for Joe Biden. As hypothetical, I am not saying that that is how they program those machines. I am just pointing out that this testimony here is that the machines do have that capability. We were told that they did not, it turns out they do. So again, I would think that would be probable cause to investigate the administrative logs to these machines and see what the rules were and what the algorithms were that they used to program these vote counts. Immediately upon walking in, I, I ran into uh, Randy Bishop and Randy owns radio stations. He, he's very IT savvy. He said, Brian, I was here all night. What, what's going on here is unbelievable. He said, let me show you something right now before I leave. So he walked me over to the high speed scanners and tabulators. And he said, see all these ethernet lines running out of the uh, tabulators. They're all bundled together as they accumulate. And then they're all connected to these routers. And then they all go to the main uh, computer. He said, these are all hooked into the internet and that is illegal. And it should not be happening because it opens them up to hacking. One of the reasons I've always stated based on our discussions, your testimony that yeah, to my knowledge, it's almost impossible to change the vote tally by hacking these computers was based on the fact that well, these things are not connected. Most of them don't even have the capability of being connected to the Internet. You know, based on all these allegations people are talking to, it sounds like some of these machines are showing the tabulators can and, and are connected to the Internet. Can you speak to that? Where a vote is cast uh, on Election Day, those machines tend to and should not be uh, connected to the Internet, certainly as a best practice. But, but some have the capability, don't they? Uh, some may have uh, modems uh, that are typically uh, disabled, but in certain states, I believe in Wisconsin, some are temporarily activated to transmit, uh, transmit some counts. But again, but, th but those tabulators are connected on Election Day because that's how they transmit the data to the counties and also into the unofficial. Uh, in some cases, yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. okay. These systems are not what you've been told. They are connected to the Internet. There is no transparency as, as uh, our... our uh, previous witnesses mentioned as to how the voter information is processed, how and where it's stored. The voting record is able to be modified and or deleted by operators, administrators, and outside threats. Operators can assign votes for write-in ballots, white ballots, or error ballots in large numbers so that they can be directed toward one candidate or another at the operator's supervisor's uh, discretion. So these systems, uh, in a nutshell, allow authorized and unauthorized users to cancel votes, shift votes, preload votes, vote blank ballots, all in real time, and in large numbers. This next video is testimony and security footage of poll workers testifying to the fact that they were duplicating ballots. Surveillance footage obtained by voter GA appears to show large numbers of ballots being scanned multiple times. Pay attention to the tape we're showing you to the woman wearing yellow at the desk. According to voter GA, she slides ballots into a scanning machine, removes the ballots, and then reinserts the same ballots. This happens multiple times. The question is, how many times were those ballots counted? Was each vote counted more than once? Fulton County won't answer that question. Now, one way to know the answer would be to check what are called audit tally sheets. Tellingly, for months after the presidential election, Fulton County failed to provide more than 100,000 of those tally sheets, including 50,000 of them for mail-in ballots. When voter GA finally forced Fulton County to turn over the tally sheets, the conclusion was stunning. Here's what the audit found, quote, seven falsified audit tally sheets containing fabricated vote totals. For example, a batch containing 59 actual ballot images for Joe Biden and 42 for Donald Trump was reported as 100 for Biden and zero for Trump. The seven batches of ballot images with 554 votes for Joe Biden, 140 votes for Donald Trump, and 11 votes for Joe Jorgensen had tally sheets in the audit falsified to show 850 votes for Biden, zero votes for Trump, and zero votes for Jorgensen. Ballots came up. They were rubber banded together in groups of 50 for a total group of 200 that were put through the machines. I counted the ballots, uh, and the ballots that went through the tabulator machine were 196. So I commented to the workers. I said, well, that's kind of interesting because on the laptop, it showed 204 ballots that were counted. But on the tabulator, only 196 went through. So I asked the workers about that, and they said they didn't know why that happened, that they had to put some of them through twice, but they didn't know why, and that I would have to speak to a supervisor. Based off my sampling, because I was one minute, okay, sampling off of the, the dozen of the duplicate ballots from 6 to 2 p.m. Uh, 2 p.m. the next day, none of those were for Trump. Um, the other, other two rounds, I only saw one for Trump. Three other challengers told me they witnessed the same sampling. And then you, there was another ballot that you identified, you challenged specifically? Absolutely, because when they scanned it, the little window it was popped up on the computer. It said duplicate already processed. So what happened with that? So they, they that? initially put it into the provisional ballot folder like they should have. Okay. And then when I went up at the end of my shift, she told me that all of the ballots in the provisional folder would be taken out and put into the folder to be tabulated because the tabulator would uncover the error. The tabulator would find out that this was a duplicate ballot. And I asked her that twice because I was under the impression that the tabulator is a counter. So I asked her, how will the tabulator uncover that? She told me and she assured me the tabulator would uncover the error. As the weeks progressed, the observers were informed that the board was going to be duplicating damaged mail-in ballots that could not be read by the scanners. I was told that there were more than 5,000 of these damaged ballots. The process for duplicating these ballots was for two workers to work as a pair. 
one worker reading out loud what was marked on the original damaged ballot, and the second worker using a pink highlighter to mark the choice on the duplicate ballot. The board's plan, then, was to run the pink highlighted ballots through the scanners where they would be counted as votes. The board workers did this pink highlighter duplication work over the course of a couple days until thousands of ballots were duplicated with these pink highlighters. On Thursday, November 12th, the observers were informed that the pink highlighter could not be read by the scanners. They all had to be done again. And the Philadelphia Board of Elections solution to this problem was to give the workers who were working alone, individually, stacks of hundreds of what amounted to blank mail-in ballots. And the workers, individually, were to fill in the correct highlighted ovals with dark pen. No observation. They were marking thousands of blank mail-in ballots. The workers did this double recreation work for hours before the observers realized what was going on, because we weren't told what was going on. Thousands of mail-in ballots were ultimately counted in this way. This video is of Chris Wallace, who I think is a total weasel. I can't stand him, but he is trying to BS everybody and tell them that all of these irregularities are totally fine because states are allowed to pass their own election laws. So they can, states can handle it however they want. And Brett Hume lays the hammer down on him by pointing out that no, it's the state legislatures that get to craft these laws for their individual states. And in a lot of these states where these irregularities have occurred, it was not the state legis legislature that changed the laws. It was people from the executive branch or the judicial branch or just political appointee bureaucrats that decided to make these adjustments to mail-in voting for COVID. So Chris Wallace can say whatever he wants to justify these instances of illegality when it comes to counting these votes, but Brit Hume is correct that if these changes were not made by the state legislature, then they are unconstitutional. And by the constitution, every state sets its own rules for elections. So, you know, Pennsylvania's rules can be utterly different and that's com completely legal if it is done by state officials. And we, you know, no, we've no, seen some states count early votes first, some count them last. First, it's not just state officials, it's the state legislature that the constitution confers the authority to set the rules. And if state officials come along later and say, well, geez, you know, we got this pandemic and it's awful, um, they don't have authority to change that. But then you have to interpret what the legislature's done in the midst of this pandemic and yeah, all that rest. Yeah, right. And then, then you get the courts involved. If you have a deadline in law, right, and somebody says, well, we're going to count votes that are after the deadline, there's not a lot of interpreting to be done there. It's, yeah, but, votes but, but, are late. It's, it's more complicated. But you're going to hear a lot of talk about vote suppression. In some cases, that might be true. But in a lot of cases, it, it amounts to an insistence on following the law. These next clips are testimony about the number of mail-in ballots that don't match up to the vote totals. The number of ballots that were sent out don't match up to how many were received. And then other evidence of fraudulent ballots. On November 4th, 1130, the Department of State posted updated mail-in vote counts for Philadelphia County, showing 508,112 ballots, despite the fact that only 432,873 432, ballots uh, were in fact issued to voters. This data was later corrected, but the question becomes who had the authorization to change and correct that information and who had access to the system? Any type of system control would ask for that. You sent out in the state of uh, Commonwealth of Pennsylvania 1,823, 148 absentee or mail-in ballots. You received back 1.4 million approximately. However, the account for president you counted 2.5 million. I don't know what accounts for that 700,000 difference between the number of ballots you sent out and the number of ballots that ended up in the count. That number, 2,589,242, was on your government website until yesterday. And yesterday it was removed without explanation. And I can't imagine you could possibly certify without knowing the explanation of that, as well as the explanation to the 22,686 mail-in ballots that were returned on the day they were mailed. About 32,591 were returned the day after they were mailed. Another 20,000 were returned before they were mailed. They only submitted 8,021 ballots from dead people, mail-in ballots for dead people. Probably easier for dead people to submit mail-in ballots than it is to vote in person. You had about 30,000 of those. You have 4,984 mail-in ballots that were never requested, and on and on and on and on. So in addition to the 682,770 ballots, that were entered without a single inspection of any kind. There also appear to be 700,000 mail-in ballots that were never sent out, that were counted. There are, there are no discrepancies. There are pretty big discrepancies. Well, the universe of the votes was only supposed to be 120,000 mail-in ballots. We were told there were 6,000 ballots remaining. So I said, okay, we have a universe of 126,000 votes. And then when I get back there, the universe wasn't 126,000 votes. The universe was 200,000 votes. What I observed in the locked room in the back office was 70,000 unopened mail-in ballots. They were in boxes of 500, stacked in neatly. The gentleman that came in with me is a, was a, Dem a Democrat poll watcher. We both agreed as GOP poll watchers and a Democrat poll watcher that we had uh, witnessed 70, 60 to 70,000. We had a little bit of a disagreement there. The problem with that was by that time, the 
mail-in ballots had already been counted. So 120,000 mail-in ballots had already been counted, posted, and done. So my question is, where did the 70,000 ballots go? And nobody knows. The download of November 16, 2020, shows 75,505 more ballots returned on 11-16 than the comparable download on November 15th. So that basically means an additional 75,505 ballots were added to the data set. This next clip is testimony out of Michigan about how ballots were being backdated, so it looked like they were filled out on or before Election Day, as opposed to the dates that they were being filled out, which was, I believe, the day after. And then those ballots were being filled in with obviously fraudulent birth dates. We observed ballots being backdated from 11-4 to 11-2, and data being entered into the computers for these mail-in ballots. Poll workers were entering ballot information from new mail-in ballots, including dates of birth of 1-1-1900. Now we're going to take a look at the security footage of these suitcases that are being wheeled out from underneath the tables after the poll workers were told to go home. And the fact checkers will tell you that this is a to totally normal chain of custody for how they keep track of these ballots. The security footage has been reviewed by investigators, and there's nothing suspicious about it. I saw four suitcases come out from underneath the table. But those are not suitcases. 11 Alive has confirmed they're the standard ballot containers used by Fulton County. The video shows is that they have pulled out uh, plastic bins from underneath the desks. Those are, are bins that they keep under their under their desks near the scanners. The video is not new. State investigators reviewed the State Farm surveillance tapes weeks ago. Gabriel Sterling with the Secretary of State's office tweeted, the 90-second video of election workers purporting to show fraud was watched in its entirety by Georgia Secretary of State investigators, shows normal ballot processing. Now, the reason I am not satisfied with this fact check is because if what they just said in that clip is true, that the entire security footage has been reviewed by investigators, then I would like to see how those suitcases arrived at that polling location. What time did they get wheeled in? Did they get wheeled in before the polls opened for the day? How did they get there? That to me would be more interesting and more telling to know who dropped them off and how when they arrived than it necessarily would be to see them wheeling it out. But that part of the video has never been shown, and to my knowledge, I'm the only person that's asked to see it. And this last bit of testimony that I will show you is about how a lot of these mail-in ballots were counted without supervision from bipartisan poll challengers, which is against the law. The Philadelphia Board of Elections processed hundreds of thousands of mail-in ballots with zero civilian oversight or observation. The mail-in ballots were handled, processed, opened, and counted in Hall F of the Convention Center. Hall F is a vast room, approximately 350 feet by 350 feet. That's about 120,000 square feet. The Board of Elections erected a fence approximately 50 feet into the hall that ran the length of the room. All observers were corralled behind the fence. More than 100 board workers were proce workers processed and opened mail-in ballots on the other side of the fence. These masked workers were arranged throughout the 120,000 square feet at a distance from the observers of about 10 feet to more than 200 feet away from us. Due to the distance of the workers from the erected fences, it was impossible for me or any observer to see what the workers were doing with any type of specificity. What became of concern was the back room, which had no observers, no line of sight or transparency into the process. There was no cooperation, complete resistance from election night and every day after. It took until our lawyer got an injunction to get into that back room in which pre-canvassing was transpiring. This next clip is testimony of poll workers talking about how they were intimidated for speaking out against these obvious instances of fraud at their polling centers, how they were dismissed by the people running their polling locations. I actually was asked to be a minority inspector in um, 3615, that's the ward of the division. I'm actually not, a, I'm a registered Democrat and I just wanted to help and make sure it was a fair election. I don't, I don't care who wins, I care that it's a fair election. Uh, the man who was electioneering and was a poll watcher but also a committee man, um, confronted myself and the clerk and said, you don't know what you're talking about. Anybody can sign the affidavit. Um, why don't you stop trying to cause problems? Why don't you shut up? Started getting in my face, cursing at me, telling me that I needed to be quiet. And my clerk and I said, no, we're not going to let that happen. That's ridiculous. It says very clearly in our training and on this sheet that an affidavit needs to be signed by the judge of elections if somebody's going to turn in a mail-in ballot before they can go vote in the booth. The majority inspector threatened to slap me in the face and uh, he told me that it was going to become a quote unquote racial issue. I'm not really sure why that would become a racial issue. It has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with following procedure and making sure it's not a selection. By midday on Wednesday, there were no more Republicans allowed into the room. Um, there was a, a lot of uh, intimidation around those who were in the room, particularly the men and the lawyers, and they were hauled out um, forcibly by the police for really no good reason, while the whole room of, of workers cheered. This is intimidating. They stood and they cheered repeatedly as Republicans were hauled out for doing their job. 
The second time I was uh, surrounded by um, Republican, or I'm sorry, Democrat uh, challengers who again were yelling at me, calling me a racist, telling me my mother didn't love me, all kinds of you know, stupid but meant to intimidate things. I witnessed the room erupt in thunderous applause and derogatory cheering as Republican poll workers were picked off one by one and ejected from the room repeatedly by police escort throughout the day. By the end of the day, they picked off so many GOP poll workers that there were probably only a few dozen left to monitor all of the processing stations in the room, which I'm told was between 130 and 160. Because of this, I had to move between several tables. One was processing a stack of roughly 35 ballots with pink challenge stickers on them. Many other tables also had similar stacks on them as well. None of the ballots appeared to be in the poll database, so the poll workers were simply entering 1-1-1900 as the birth dates and entering the addresses and names that no one seemed to be verifying and which I could not see to verify. When I politely tried to check such things, as had been the case throughout the, the entire day, I was told that I wasn't allowed within six feet of the tables even to verify ballots and told that I was trying to kill people. I watched as the tables simply pass in mismatched ballots and envelopes through the checking station. When I challenged it and subsequent ballots that weren't in the poll book, the table supervisor laughed and said, you can't do that. So I found it highly unusual that every military ballot that was logged into the system had a birth date of January 1st, 1900, and nobody could tell me why the birth dates were 1900. When I went to challenge those votes, the supervisor at the table told me, and I quote, we're not doing that. So I pressured her. I said, I want this challenge. I want it noted in the laptop and in the poll, in the poll book. So she wrote down in the poll book, Karen Cordes is challenging this, and this vote, and she said, because I told her, is challenging every subsequent ballot hereafter. That's what I think the media has been very good at, is focusing on these small instances that they can explain away with technicalities to dismiss this broader allegation of voter fraud. Because when you look at these small instances, it's easy to get lost in the weeds and miss the big picture of just how shady that whole election went down. I personally think it is far more likely that all of those things are true and they just add up and that they actually did cheat as opposed to thinking that Donald Trump would somehow be smart enough to plant all of these weird anomalies to make them look bad. If people were so confident in the results, then there shouldn't be any reason to worry about it and you shouldn't have a problem with people investigating so they can also feel confident with the results of these elections, just like we did in 2016. But I know that that is never going to happen, so we will never be able to say for sure what really went down.